Okay. All right. Bruchim Abayim. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. Hashem, we begin our study of Parashat Yitro, which is <clears throat> this week's parasha. We'd like to uh, dedicate tonight's learning um, very sadly. The uh, Ilui Nishmat, my Rebbe, Rav Baruch Ben Sivia, Zechert Ligvachar Baruch Weisbecker, uh, who passed away this morning. May his neshama go higher and higher in Gan Eden. And may he be a melitz yosher for all of us, for all of his talmidim, on all of Klal Yisrael. Um, just a um, little, little tidbit about my Roshiva Baruch, Zechit Tzadik Devracham, who passed away this morning. Um, he was, first of all, a Torah genius, a Torah giant. somebody that really spent his entire life learning. Um, he was somebody that uh, that was close to all of the Gdolim, the Stipler, Rav Shach, Rav Shlomo Zalman, Zechit Tzadik Levracha. Um, tremendous clarity in his learning. He could show you that whatever it is that you thought you knew, what you thought you understood in learning, he he would show you you had no idea what you were actually, actually learning with such depth. But also he had such great wisdom and practical advice for people. Um, And uh, it was always a, a real pleasure to hear him give such wonderful advice to people and, and to see how he conducted himself. Um, he was very kind and very warm to so many people and loved Am Yisrael a lot. So uh, there's so much to say about him. I'm going to try and put something uh, together uh, in writing a proper Hesped, uh, but um, just wanted to mention that we're learning tonight Lilui Nishmato. I had the zuchut to learn in his yeshiva in Bnei Brak for two years, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's it's very sad to see an Adam Gadol like that, who was considered to be uh, one of the Gedolei Israel, uh, passing on. What can you do? Hashem has his plans. So we learn Leilu Nishmat to be Baruch Ben Tzivia Zecher to the Bracha. We also learn Leilu Nishmat. Um, we also learn uh, for the Rufu Shlem, or rather, Leavdi Ben Chaim Lechaim of Menachem Ben Choshid, and also of Um, uh, Malkiel ben Soraya, may Hashem send them a refuashma betoch shar chole Israel. Okay, so we begin the parasha with a discussion of Yitro, one of the very interesting, um, characters, the character, people, father in law of Moshe Rabbeinu. One of the very interesting psukim that we start off the parasha with is where it talks about the idea. that Yitro comes to the desert after the Jewish people left the uh, left Egypt. And now there is a moment where he brings Sipora, Moshe's wife, and he brings Moshe's two children back to Moshe. And over here, there's a very interesting pasuk. So he says, Vayomer el Moshe, he tells Moshe, Ani choten cha Yitro ba'elecha. I am Yitro, your uh, your father-in-law. I have come to you, Ishtecha and your wife, Ushne Baneha Ima, and her two sons with her. Right? They, they, we, we're all here. Now, the obvious question is, uh, if it's if that's really what's going on, if you are telling Moshe that you are your, his father-in-law, well, he needs an explanation. He doesn't know who you are. What's going on over here? Right, Vayomer el Moshe, and he told Moshe, "I am your father-in-law Yitro." So, what does that mean? He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know who his wife and his children are. So, over here, there's a very interesting explanation. Rashi tells us over here that this was through a shaliach. What this meant was that there was a shaliach, a messenger, who was delivering this message. In other words, it wasn't that he was face to face with Moshe, but rather he delivered a message. At which point. Uh, Moshe received the message through the messenger, and that's how uh, Rashi explains the uh, the idea that he has to tell him that I am Yitro. Okay, fine. So over here, however, <clears throat> there's a comment 
that comes from the Midrash Tanhuma, quoted by the tour. The Midrash Tanhuma says something very fascinating. This Midrash is, is going to address this question a little bit differently than Rashi did. So over here, the Midrash says the following very interesting situation. Yitro shows up to the desert with Sipor, with the two kids, and he can't get in. He's not able to get into the encampment of the Jews. Why is that? Because the Jewish people are surrounded by the clouds of glory. And therefore, there is no access for somebody who is not yet a part of the Jewish nation. So Yitro is out. And uh, and therefore, he cannot he cannot converse with Moshe. He can't tell Moshe that he's even there. Now, before we continue, I, I'm assuming that this Midrash is telling us that Moshe's two children and his wife also couldn't get in, um, which is an interesting thing to think about because they definitely were part of the Jewish nation. As you know, we already learned in Shemot that, um, that Moshe gave a brit milat to his son, and uh, the assumption is that Zipporah was definitely a Jew. Um, so, I mean, the, the question is, why couldn't they get in? Uh, even if the Ananek HaKavod wouldn't let Yitro in, why wouldn't they be in? I am assuming that perhaps the answer is because of what we're going to say uh, shortly, which is where, where it says, Moshe likrat chot. No, it's brought down that Moshe went out eventually to greet his father-in-law. And when he greeted his father-in-law, so then uh, Moshe saw that, uh, Aaron saw that Moshe went out. So Aaron said, well, if my brother Moshe, who's the leader of the Jewish people, went out for this man, I should definitely go out for this man. And then Nadav and Avihu saw that their father went out for this man. They said, well, if our father went out to greet this man, we should. And all the elders saw that Moshe, Aaron, Nadav and Avihu went out to greet Yitro. So then they should definitely go out to greet Yitro. And then everybody went out to greet Yitro. So it was a tremendous moment where there is this great greeting that's given to Yitro. Possibly the reason for this is because there was a there was a uh, Hashem wanted to give great honor to Yitro for all that he had done, uh, for the fact that he went against the will of Paro and fought against the idea uh, that there should be a final solution to the Jews of Egypt, and he protested and he had to run for his life. The fact that he left idolatry, the fact that he was on top of the world, and he had to uh, and and he left the comfort of his high priesthood and his status, etc., in order to to join the Jewish people, at least according to Rashi's opinion. So it, it's very possible that in order to give this great honor to Yitro, perhaps that's why the clouds of glory didn't allow um, didn't allow Tzipora and the two sons of Moshe to come in, uh, although they were actually also Jewish uh, themselves. To give that, maybe that's an answer. It's a thought that I have, not sure. But perhaps that's the idea. At any rate, the Midrash Tanhuma goes on to say that Yitro was unable to enter into the Ananea Kavod. So he's unable to enter. So what does he do? So he has this idea. The idea is that he takes an arrow and he attaches to the arrow a message. And on this mess, in this message is what the Pasuk itself says. Ani chotencha Yitro. I am your father, Noito. I have come to you, and your wife and your two children are with, and her two children are with her. And he takes that arrow and he throws it into the Ananea Kavod, into the clouds of glory. At which point, um, at which point, the clouds of glory receive that arrow, they receive that message. Now, you'll ask, well, don't we know that the clouds of glory protected against arrows of the enemies and all that stuff? Well, that's true. But that was because of the fact that they were uh, trying to hurt the Jewish people. This arrow was actually trying to uh, trying to connect Moshe to his father-in-law. So out of the honor of Moshe, out of the honor of Yitro, uh, it's possible that uh, that's why the cloud of glory allowed it to enter. And that's how they found out that Yitro was outside with Tzipora and with his two children, with, with two children of Moshe. Now, there is an incredible um, midrash that is brought in a sefer called Tosafot Hashalim, and the midrash says the following: 
says, who was the individual who found this arrow? So we're working with this Midrash that he threw, took the arrow, threw it into the clouds of glory. Who is the one who found it and then delivered it to Moshe? So it says over here in this Midrash that the fellow who found it was actually Moshe's uncle. The Pasuk tells us that Moshe had uh, Moshe's father was Amram and Amram had his youngest brother was Uziel. Uziel. So over here it says um, the Pasuk tells us, Mishael el Uziel Dod Aaron. So this is, a, this is a very interesting Pasuk. The Pasuk over there talks about the idea that Nadav and Avihu, um, later on in the Torah, Nadav and Avihu passed away when they brought the Ketoret that they were not supposed to bring in the Mishkan on the day of the inauguration of the Mishkan. And when they did so, they died. Hashem, Hashem took them. So now, Somebody needed to go and take out their bodies. Mishael and El Tzafan, the cousins of Nadav and Avihu, were called in to do it. So when it mentions who Mishael and El Tzafan are, they say that it was Mishael and El Tzafan, the Bnei Uziel, the sons of Uziel, Dod Aharon, the uncle of Aaron. Now you'll ask, well, you know, why, why are you mentioning the uncle of Aaron? What's the pshat, uncle of Aaron? The simple explanation is, well, we're dealing with Nadav and Avihu. Nadav and Avihu are the sons of Aaron. So we're talking about Aaron. So now we're talking about Mishael and Safan. So we're going to mention that it happens to be Aaron's uncle. Okay, very good. That's a simple explanation. But the Rabbeinu Bache over there brings down something amazing. This is all, by the way, this this beautiful shtickle can be found in uh, Sefer Otsar Torah, just beautifully put together, um, and it says over here in in uh, on page you could look at it tough ein tet very nicely put together. He brings down this concept, and he brings down a beautiful explanation. He says the following idea that Bnei Uziel, right? Uh, why were why are we calling Uziel the uncle of Aaron over here? So says the Rabbeinu Bachi lekach iskir dod Aaron. Because there's a message the Torah is trying to teach us. As we know, Aharon, says Rabbi Nubachye, was a man who was Ohev Shalom Verodev Shalom. He was a man who loved peace and he chased after peace. Says Rabbi Nubachye, he kish Uziel le'aron. So the, the Torah connects Uziel to Aharon. The reason that the Torah calls Uziel the uncle of Aaron is to try and tell us that the deeds of Uziel were very similar to the deeds of Aaron. In the same way that Aaron chased after peace, ran after peace, did whatever he could for peace, loved peace, Uziel, his uncle, was the same way. Okay. So therefore, so what does that have to do with us? Why is it that Uziel is the one who should find the, the arrow that was shot in Baitro. So says over here the Otsar Peloda Torah. So he has a beautiful explanation. He says, Galgel has chut al yado le ashiv lev avot al banim, liot ha gorem le had le ahed at Moshe Rabenu im shne banav. So he says that if Uziel was a man who was always running after peace, he was trying to uh, bring families together that they shouldn't be divided, that they should be in peace with each other, or partners to have peace with one another. So then Uziel was a man of peace. And the rule is, which means that Hashem allows good things to happen to people who have done good things already, to people who are good people that have zikhut, that have merits. So somebody who already has merits, he's a meritorious person, Hashem sends the zechut, the good things to happen through such a person. So Uziel was somebody who was like Aharon. He made uh, he made an effort to bring peace between people. So Hashem allowed him to be the one to reunite Moshe with his two sons. Now he goes on to say that at this point already, Moshe was divorced from his wife. I have a hard time with that because Yitro says to him, uh, which means she's still your wife. So to me, what it sounds like, what it's saying is, is that you are going to be reunited now with your wife as well. 
right? And your two children. So you, so Uziel, I mean, I like his pshat. I think his pshat works out very well. He is reuniting the entire family together. Um, so that's why he's telling he's telling him, it's your wife and her two sons with her. And that is something that is very important to reunite this family at this time. We definitely know at a later time, um, or it could be that it was already right at this moment, Hashem did instruct Moshe Rabbeinu to divorce his wife. That is indeed correct. Um, he informed him that marriage is not for somebody on his level. Okay, that's something uh, which is which is unique for Moshe Rabbeinu. But at the same time, it, it it's clear that there was a reunification on some level of the family of Moshe Rabbeinu, and it was brought about through Uziel because he is somebody who. Constantly did that. He brought zechut between. He brought uh, shalom, uh, peace between people. Okay. Just by the way, you know, s- sometimes, you know, somebody does something. I can't imagine that Yitro was expecting this incredible, incredible kavod. But they came out to him, and they did. They made an incredible feast, an incredible meal for Yitro, they all came to greet him and he had a tremendous level of respect that was given to him. And um, the Ramban actually says that this was the Sudat uh, Brit Mila of Yitro, that Yitro went ahead and circumcised himself in order to become part of the Jewish people. And the Suda that they were eating together was a Suda of actually his Brit Mila, which is an incredible thing. So he's going from one level to the next. Um, but just the idea, the way Rashi presents it, that Moshe went out to greet his father-in-law, so Aaron saw that, and then Aaron went, and then Nadav and Aviv saw that, the sons of Aaron saw that, and then they went, and then the rest of the elders saw that, and they all went. So everybody's going to greet this man because of uh, because of what they saw Moshe doing. It reminded me of a story um, that I heard about a big tzaddik, a, a big Rosh Hashiva in Europe at the time, that eventually made his way to America. His name was uh, Ravi, Ravi Yisrael Gustman, Zecher Tzadik um, And uh, the interesting story about him was that he was very dear, he was very beloved um, to Rav Chaim Ozer Grudzenski, who was like the Gdola Dor before, uh, before the war in Europe. And he asked Rav Yisrael Gustman to be on his Beddin when he was a much younger man. But he wanted to establish in the presence of all the great rabbis of the of, of Europe that this um, that this rabbi Rabbi Israel Gustman is indeed a great Torah scholar and he deserves to be on the bed and deserves to have a lot of respect. So he invited him to a meeting of rabbis, and Rabbi Chaim Ozer Guzenski um, specifically told Rav Gustman to show up um, at a certain time, which was about. Let's say, I don't know exactly how many minutes late, but it was late. He told him to come at a certain time. He knew he would come on time. And the time that he gave him was was late. So he showed up at this massive meeting of, of Rabbanim of Europe, at which the Chafetz Chaim was present and many other great Gdolim were present. And uh, and they asked this young rabbi to come. And, he, and he, the time that he gave him was late specifically. So they're all having this meeting. And uh, Rav Gustman shows up late. Uh, and that was the plan of Rav Chaim Ozer. When he saw Rav Gustman, so Rav Chaim Ozer stood up for him. And the Chavetz Chaim took a look at Rav Chaim Ozer and he said, Rav Chaim Ozer is standing up for him. So I guess I also, also should stand up for him. The Chavetz Chaim stood up for him. Now, all of a sudden, you have the two Gdolei Hador uh, that the whole Klal Yisrael is resting on their shoulders. And they're standing up for this young man. Uh, so then everybody else, all of the Gdolim that were there, they all stood up for this man. So the, the rabbi said later on in life uh, that uh, there was there was never any experience of kavod as uh, as great that he ever experienced as that one moment where he comes in and everybody, the Chaim Ozer and the Chavetz Chaim and everybody's standing up for him. He says that was like, you know, something to, to remember. But over here, Yitro got... Even even greater, Moshe, Aaron, Aaron's children, Shivim Zkenim. I mean, everybody is on the way out to greet Yitro, which is quite an amazing thing. So, uh, talking about Megal Gilim Zechut, somebody who has so many merits, 
he merits to have more mitzvot. First of all, he gets to do even more mitzvot, brit milah, and to come closer to Hashem, to become a Jew. As a matter of fact, it's brought down in Rashi that he ended up going uh, back to his family to convert the rest of his family. <clears throat> and he ends up having an entire parasha named after him. And that's going to be because of the um, because of the advice that he's going to give to Moshe, which we're going to talk about shortly. As a matter of fact, it's embedded in his name, Yitro. Rashi tells us she, the name Yitro is because she yiter parasha achat Torah, because he caused for an added parasha in the Torah based on what he gave, uh, based on the advice that he gave to Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay. So that's very interesting. By the way, there's an interesting Midrash that is brought down in a Tiferet Yisrael and Kiddushim. Tiferet Yisrael is one of the Pirushim on the Mishnayot. Um, and he comments, he brings down a Midrash in Masechet Kiddushim, which is quite an amazing Midrash. Midrash says, uh, but we're going to see that shortly, there are those who refute it based on this Midrash. So hold on. So the Midrash over there that he quotes says that there was a certain king who heard about Moshe Rabbeinu and that king that king heard that Moshe Rabbeinu was indeed a, a tremendous tremendous person and he wanted to see a picture of him so he hired um, an artist to go and to paint a portrait of Moshe Rabbeinu to go look at him and to paint a portrait and to come back and to show it to him the Midrash says that that artist indeed managed to go and see him and he painted this uh, this picture, and he came back and showed the king, and then the king had wise men that were able to read a person's character traits based on looking at his face, and they ended up saying that Moshe Rabbeinu was actually a very uh, angry person, uh, a person that's very violent and very uh, all kinds of things they had to say about it. And so somehow they, they came back, uh, and they discussed this with uh, with Moshe, and Moshe said, "Indeed, that's that's true. However, I, th- that that might be my nature. But at the same time, uh, you know, the person uh, is able to change, you know, based on the effort that he puts in something to that effect, which is very interesting. So the Maril Diskin uses this midrash that we studied before as a proof against the other midrash. He says, how could it be that it's that anybody would be able to come from a foreign country to the desert to see Moshe Rabbeinu. Here's Yitro. His own father-in-law can't see him. He has to throw an arrow into the Neakavod with a message, like a you know, message in a bottle, <laughs> you know, and uh, he can't see him, let alone some random guy from a foreign, foreign country. So says the Maharil Diskin, that that Midrash, that the Tiferet Yisrael quotes, uh, it, it's impossible that that would be the case based on what we learned before, about the Ananea Kavod not allowing people in um, from the outside. Many explain that even the Erev Rav, which are the people that were brought in, that Moshe Rabbeinu allowed to tag on when they left Egypt, were also not allowed into the Ananea Kavod. So, you know, here are all these people that would have some connection and they're not allowed in. So some random guy should be allowed in uh, that should be able to see Moshe. Almost impossible. That was the that was the refutation from the Maharil Diskin based on this Midrash. Very interesting. Now, one of the one of the very amazing things that again there are many Midrashim on about Yitro, but one of the fascinating things that the Midrash says is that when Moshe married into the family of Yitro, there was a discussion. And Yitro made Moshe swear that the first son that Moshe has is going to be uh, somebody who goes in the path of idolatry. Somebody who is going to be an idol worshiper. And he made Moshe swear to it. And seemingly if Moshe got married to Zipporah, that's something that he had to do. He swore to that idea. The question is, how is that possible? How is that even possible that Moshe would swear that Yitro, um, the, what Yitro asked him to swear? That's question number one. Question number two, by the time Moshe had already met up with Yitro, Yitro was not an idolater anymore. It, as a matter of fact, we had learned a few weeks back 
Yitro was excommunicated because he stopped doing idolatry. So how could he ask Moshe to do that? So and the, the sad, the saddest part of the story is that there are some who say, there are some of Farshim who say that when you learn Sefer Shoftim and you see the discussion about Pesil Micha, which is the idol of Micha that unfortunately made its way to the land of Israel, and it says that there was a Levi there, a uh, some Jew from the tribe of Levi who was the son of Gershom, right? So it says that this guy was a priest for idolatry. So wait a second. Who's Gershom? So some say that this was actually Moshe Rabbeinu's grandson that was a priest for idolatry. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling to even think that Moshe Rabbeinu would set off his son on a path that's going on in a, 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 idolatry. How does that even work? So there's a beautiful take on this from Rab Shimon Schwab, Zecher Tzadik Levacha that in his opinion, he says it's possible that Yitro felt the following. Again, Yitro was not an idolater at this point. But Yitro was a tremendous believer. At, at this point in his life, he understood that there is nothing, no God that is like HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And he had an incredible level of awareness and closeness to Hashem. So Yitro looked at, at himself and he said, how did I get here? How did I get to this point? And he concluded that the only way that he was able to reach this point was because of the fact that he had gone through so many experiences. He had worshipped so many different idols. He had seen it all. And he has realized that after all of his soul searching, quote unquote, and after all of his experiences, there was nothing that really seemed emit besides for Hashem being the God, so to say, and his Torah being true. So Yitro had such a solid clarity about this. He had such clear, he, he such a clear understanding about this that Yitro then goes ahead and says, look, I want my children to have that clarity as well, but they're only going to have it if they go through what I went through as well. They also have to see idolatry. They also have to see all these other experiences. They also have to become aware of what's out there. Try it. Look at it. Observe it. Make an effort to, to even to do it. And then they'll realize it's all vanity. It's all emptiness. It's all fake. It's all phony. It's all baloney. And then when they finally circle back and they come towards the emet, they come towards the truth, their truth will be everlasting. Their truth will be solid. It'll be firm and it'll never go away. So that was the frame of mind that Yitro was in when he suggested this to Moshe Rabbeinu. So in other words, it was not for the purpose of <clears throat> going towards idolatry, but rather it was for, for the purpose of having a better and more clear understanding of Hashem and being able to be closer to Hashem that much more based on that. Now, the problem with that was that it had devastating results. And look at this. It might not have been, it might not have affected Gershom, although some did say that that was Gershom himself. But even if it wasn't Gershom himself, it was his grandson. But look at the result that eventually down there, because of introducing his child to becoming more familiar and more accustomed and more more comfortable with idolatry, eventually down the road, it had an effect on his own grandson, on Moshe Rabbeinu's own grandson. So it turns out that although the theory might sound reasonable, but in reality, that is not the proper way to do chinuch for the children. So you know, it's important to, to realize that um, that concept, that the chinuch of a, of a Jewish child has to be really uh, what's called al ta'arat kodesh based on, on purity and to, in, to keep them as pure as possible for as long as possible. Okay, so moving along, understanding more of Yitro and his ideas and, uh, and his suggestions, Yitro comes with the, the famous suggestion in this week's parasha and he says to Moshe, listen Moshe, I see that the people are standing around you from day till night and you're 
you're involving yourself with them in their affairs, but nabol tibol, you're going to collapse. It's not possible for one person to deal with everything all by himself. You have to take for yourself people that are going to help you. You have to take for yourself people that are going to be judges. There are people that are uh, men of valor, men that hate money, men that, that don't care about other things, about nonsense. You know, really good judges, and you set them up, and you make a, a, a tier, you make a court system with uh, with a first, second court, second, second court, etc., appeals court, whatever. You build yourself a system of courts, a ju- judicial system that's going to work for you. It'll take the load off of you. So, so you don't have to do all this alone. So that was the first statement of Yitro. Now, there are a couple of questions that we have to understand. The first thing to understand is what court cases were there exactly? At this point, we are in the desert. There's nothing here. I mean, I'll give you an example. Usually the Batei Din are involved with all kinds of monetary disputes. This guy said this, and this guy said that. He took this, he took that. This guy's opening up a business too close to my business, right? The second pizza shop or the second... uh, uh, whatever it is, you know, and there aren't the Hasagat Gvul, you're, you're encroaching upon my territory. There are all kinds of cases you oh. took from my land, a few feet over here, a few, all kinds of monetary disputes. What could you possibly have that's a monetary dispute or any really what, what disputes are going on in the desert? <clears throat> so that is a very important question. That's question number one. Now, let's say we come up with an answer. So, it's that many? I mean, how many are there? How many disputes are actually taking place on a daily basis? I mean, from morning till night? Yeah? That many disputes? That is a, that's a tough thing to understand. That's number two. Number three, Moshe Rabbeinu, you see what's happening. Why didn't you think of this idea yourself? We know that you're a brilliant person. We know that you have a connection to Hashem. Why was it you needed Yitro to come and tell you this? What's what's going on over here? Right? You, you, you could think of that on your own. So I saw a few different explanations to this, and I'll share them with you. With Hashem. So, you know, this reminds me, before we get to that, it reminds me, so, there are so many disputes that are so easily resolved. I remember Belsky, Zechir Tzadibibacha, who told us that one time there was a there was a, a family that built a brand new house. It was millions of dollars. And they didn't want to pay the contractor. And the contractor said, I don't know what to do. I mean, I built them a beautiful house and they're not paying me what, what they owe me. So they had a dispute. They went to Rav Belsky. And Rebels said, so what did he do wrong? So they had a, a bunch of complaints. And he said he looked at these complaints one by one. And he goes into the, to the house himself. And he says, I mean, these are issues that are easily fixable. And he himself took care of some of them on the spot. For example, he said one of their complaints was that in the bathroom, there was a mirror that was disaligned with the sink underneath it. So instead of it being the sink and the mirror right on top, so the sink was here and the mirror was off to the right or off to the left or something like that. So Ravdowski realized that he looked on the, on the bottom of the, uh, of the sink and he realized that there is some wiggle room over there. So he simply adjusted the location of the sink by a few inches and he realigned it with the with the mirror. So, (laughs) you know, certain things you can easily fix if you're willing to look, if you're interested in fixing them. If you want to fight, you want to have a fight, you're trying to avoid payment, then you're going to make a billion excuses, but, you know, it's not necessarily the right thing. A lot of these disputes can be easily resolved. But indeed, we know that it could take up a lot of a person's time. So Moshe Rabbeinu was in this situation, and it was going to take up all of his time. So Yitro says, that's not the way to do it. You have to free yourself up by setting up this court system. So let's go back to the questions. Number one, why was it so? What, first of all, what were these cases about? What were these disputes about? So number one, 
the, I saw this beautiful pshat in a sefer called Az Yashir, and it's from the Magid of Dubna. The Dubna Magid says this very interesting pshat. He says, if you notice the pasuk in the parasha, it says, Ki lahem davar <coughs> ba elai. When they have a matter, ba elai. Ba elai means he comes to me. So it started off saying, Ki lahem, when they have a dispute, ba elai, he comes to me. What is it? They have a dispute, he comes to me. They have a matter, he comes. What's going on? Says the Dubna Magid. The idea is the following. It doesn't say they have a dispute. It says, Ki elem davar. When they have a, when they have a matter, Ba'elai, he comes to me. The Dubna Magid says, the quote-unquote disputes that are going on over here are not disputes at all. Like we said, what disputes are you having? Does he have a competing business? Is he taking your land? We're in the desert. Nobody has anything. Says the Dubna Magid, you know what's going on? It's preventative learning, meaning a fellow comes and he asks Moshe Rabbeinu a question. He says, and what would be in this case and in that case? Would I be allowed to do this? Would I be allowed to open up my uh, porch over there? Or is that encroaching on his property? And would I be allowed to do this or that? So in other words, each fellow is coming to Moshe ba'elai individually. Not as a not as a dispute between him and somebody else, but rather as an individual to come and to say, I'm wondering about what would be in this case, in order to prevent themselves from doing what they're not supposed to do. So it's preventative. Says the Dublomagi, that's why it's in the individual, in the singular form, Ba'elai, Meaning they all have questions and they come to me individually to know what they can do and what they can't do. That's the first pshat from the Dubna Magid. Very interesting pshat. The second pshat you'll find in the Chizkuni. The Chizkuni says that the Erev Rav were claiming that Bnei Israel took things from their relatives in Egypt. They took gold, they took silver, they took all kinds of things they said they're going to borrow it, and they never gave it back. So now that we are here, we represent our relatives in Egypt, and they should give it to us. <coughs> so the dispute is actually a dispute over the spoils of Egypt, which is quite a fascinating pshat. The Chizkuni himself says he doesn't like the pshat that much, but it's an interesting idea that they are going to dispute the people who took the the spoils of Egypt. Now, I mean, I don't even know what would be the claim. Hashem told them to do this. Um, but they made the claim anyway. So, the, so And it took up so much time. Quite, quite an interesting thing. Okay. The third pshat is the disputes were over Shiduchim. This is a pshat that I heard Rabbi Moshe Meir Weiss quote in the name of the Chavetz Chaim in a biography about the Chavetz Chaim. It brings down the Chavetz Chaim asked this question and he claimed that the disputes that they had were over Shiduchim. And the reason for that was because at this time, tribes were not allowed to intermarry and therefore each, um, each tribe had to be very careful about their boys and their girls, and and it, each boy and girl was like a, a commodity. You know, you don't have that many, so th- there were disputes. How come he gets gets to marry her? How come, etc. All of these arrangements of marriages were the dispute. That's that's the the fight that they had in the desert. Okay, so now let's try and answer the question that we had. We asked the question, Moshe Rabbeinu. Here you are. You see that you have all these disputes. What is the pshat? Why is it that you are not willing? Why, why didn't you think of this idea of making a judicial system in the beginning? Why did you need Yitro to come and explain to you? So, so the Az Yashir answer is based on the first pshat, but to me, I think the Chizkuni is also part of this answer as well, because the Chizkuni says that the question was about the Erev Rab, about the people, that came and tagged along, the Egyptians that came along with the Bnei Israel, the Jews in the desert, 
and the reason that he says this is because it says many times in when Moshe is uh, talking to um, to Yitro, he says Ha'am, the nation. When the Am, when the nation comes to me, who's the Am? Who's the nation? So many times Rashi says that when it says Ha'am, it's referring to the heir of Rav. So he says the Am is coming to me. The Am is coming to to, to do judgment by me. So who is that? So it could be that's where the Chizkuni got that we're talking about the area of Rav, the, the Egyptians who tagged along. So now he says, let's take that idea with the first pshat that we said, the Dubno Magid's pshat. It was preventative. They are having discussions with Moshe. Not that they have a dispute, but they're trying to figure out what they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do in order to avoid having a dispute. Okay. Moshe Rabbeinu looks at that and says, look, over here, what's happening is that the people are coming to me in order to learn what they could do and what they can't do. My dear father-in-law Yitro, you're worried I'm going to collapse? What collapsing? These questions are one and done. You ask me, can I do this? Can I do that? The answer is yes, no, yes, no. And now you never have to ask me the question again. You already answered. I, you received an answer from me. So what are you worried that I'm, you're gonna, you're worried I'm going to collapse under the burden? This is not something that's going to be repeating itself. You see me sitting here from morning till night, yeah, because when you have a startup company, you got to invest in the startup company. You have to work and you work and work until the thing takes off. And then you can sell your stocks and then you live the easy life. But over here, right in the beginning stages, we barely get to eat, right? So over here, Moshe Rabbeinu says, "This is our startup. I'm sitting down." I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. But once I answer these questions, I'm answering them forever. I don't have to do this anymore afterwards. You're, you're assuming this is going to take me a very long time. It's going to be a daily thing for me to sit like this all day long. This is just the beginning of our, of our country, of our nation. So I'm taking care of it now, but it's not going to be like this forever. Okay. Yitro says to him, you're wrong. Yitro says, who's coming to you? Who's around over here? Who, who's, who's, who do you have here with you? You think you only have B'nai Israel? You also have the Erev Rav. You also have people that you brought with you from Egypt. Later on, Hashem told Moshe, right? The Am Hashem Otzeta Meretz Mitzrayim, the nation that you took out, your nation you took out of Egypt, referring to the Erev Rav, you, you decided to take them with you. They made the Cheta Egel. They caused the Jews to sin with the golden calf. So Yitro is saying, look, you don't know these people. I know these people. I've been to Egypt. I know these people very, very well. They cause disputes. They cause fights. They cause issues. You think that you're going to answer a question here and there and now you're done for life? You're very wrong. He says, this is going to be an issue for you for a long, long time. It's going to be coming to haunt you. It's going to be coming at you every day. You will collapse. You didn't realize that you're going to collapse, but you will. Because I know them, you don't. So therefore, says Yitro, that is something that you must deal with at this point because of the fact that they will come after you. Again, they'll take your time and it's going to be something very, very hard for you to deal with. Okay. We now move on. <clears throat> there were many different sounds at Har Sinai. Parasha, we talk about Matan Torah, talk about the giving of the Torah, and it says, Vayhi kolotu brakim. So we know that there were many sounds, there was lightning, there was thunder, and, you know, today, I'm sure for thousands of years, People were wondering, what does it mean, the Chola Amroim at Kolot, that everybody would see the sound? What does that mean, even? How do you see sounds? So everyone assumed there's a miraculous thing, you, you know, you're able to, Maman Har Sinai, you're able to see sounds, which indeed is true. But now we know that sound has the ability to show you a vision, a picture. Sound waves, right? The idea of an ultrasound, for example, right? able to show you uh, what's inside of uh, the mom's uh, womb, which is quite an amazing thing. So, Baruch Hashem, today we have, we have an understanding even on a more basic level 
what exactly a sound could show you in a physical way. But let's just talk for a minute about what sounds were there. So it says, right, that there was this idea called the Yovel. The Yovel, Rashi tells us, is actually the Elo Shel Yitzchak, is a shofar that is blowing, right? There was a kol shofar olech v'chazek. There was a very great shofar blast. And Rashi brings down that this was actually a shofar that was being blown. And it was the shofar from Akedat Yitzchak. In other words, when the when Avram Avinu was about to slaughter Yitzchak, his son, and instead Hashem told him not to do it, and he, he then turned around and saw a ram. He took the ram and slaughtered it and offered it up as an offering. The shofar, the, the horn of that ram, was used at Har Sinai, and that was the shofar that was blown, and that's what everybody heard, which is quite an amazing thing. The Midrash goes on to say, that as a matter of fact, uh, that was only the one on the left side, right? Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer says that that was the shofar that was on the left side of the ram, but Mikeren Yamin Shehi Gdola, on the shofar that was on the right side of the of the ram of of uh, Yitzchak Avinu, so that Atid Litkoa Bala Atid Lavo Bimerabe Amenu, that is the shofar that Hashem will blow when He announces the coming of Mashiach. And that's what it says. That day, the uh, the shofar, the great shofar, will be blasted, and that's what we say every day in davening. Blast the great shofar in order to redeem us, in order to save us. Now, the Ramban asks an interesting question. He says, "How could it be that the shofar of Yitzchak was the shofar that was used from the ram of of Yitzchak?" Because that ram was brought up as an ola. Ola means a burnt offering, which means Avram Avinu burnt it to a crisp. There was nothing left but ashes. So there is no shofar horn to blow. Interesting question from the Ramban. So the Ramban says, maybe, maybe, he says, if shah, it's possible that after it was ashes, Hashem restored it by mixing it together again with something uh, with maybe some kind of a liquid and making it into a solid all over again, bring it back to what it was. Very interesting uh, give and take between Rashi and the Ramban. Now, while we're on the topic of of hearing sounds, so as you know, there is a there is a special blessing when you hear thunder. That is the blessing of Shekocho Ugvurato Male Olam. Now, there are differences, there are different uh, opinions as to whether or not when you hear thunder, you're act- you're, you are supposed to make this blessing with Hashem's name. So the Kafachaim and the Ben Yishchai uh, were of the opinion, if I'm not mistaken, definitely the Ben Yishchai, that when you hear, it says in the Gemara that you're supposed to make a bracha. Shekocho, which means that Hashem's strength Ugvurato and his might, male olam, they fill up the entire world. The thunder is something that scares a person. You hear it close by, it scares a person. So you have to you have to bless Hashem for the fact that he's all powerful. Right? That's the idea of this blessing. Now, some were of the opinion that when we say it, we don't say it with Hashem's name. So you say Baruch Shekocho Ugvurato Male Olam without actually saying Baruch Ata Hashem Olam. But the Shulchan Aruch technically says that you should say it with Hashem's name. And it seems that that is the, uh, the accepted uh, idea. Uh, if, at least uh, by, many, by many, it is the accepted idea. The Mishnah Bura holds like that. And the uh, Rav Vadi Yosef Alav Hashem held like that. And the question that, <clears throat> that comes up is, well, one very important detail before we move on to the question, which is, the halacha says that it has to be toch kedei dibu, which means that there's a concept that you can't just say it a few minutes later or even 10 seconds later. It has to be the, the second that you hear it, or at least the amount of time it takes to say shalom alecha rebi, which is how long did that take me? Two seconds. So within two seconds, maybe three, that's the extent that you have to say this blessing. 
So if you delay after that amount of time, you can't you can't say this bracha anymore. Now, the question that the poskim talk about, interestingly, is what happens if somebody is asleep, right? He's asleep, and in the middle of the night, he hears loud thunder. So what does he do? He doesn't have the ability to right now, within three seconds, go wash Natilat Yadayim to get his hands clean, and then uh, go ahead and say the bracha. It's just not possible. So if you hold like the Ben Ishchai, and you don't say the the actual name of Hashem, so a person would just be allowed to say, Baruch Shekochog, and that's it, he goes back to sleep. But if you hold that you are supposed to say the bracha, what do you do? So the Mishnah Berura and Harav Vadya, Lava Shalom, they both paskin that a person at that point while he's lying down in bed, he can just r- take his hands and rub it on the blanket or rub it on something so that he cleans it in a very, very brief way. And then right away, he says the bracha uh, with Hashem's name, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Menach Olam, Shekocho Ugruato, Male Olam. Right, so and that's and similarly, he says the same idea would be if let's say somebody was in a location where he just didn't have a chance, his hands were clean or were not clean, right, and um, he didn't have the opportunity to do that. So the same idea, he could be he could simply uh, rub his hands against his clothing and say the beracha toch kedei dibur, uh, which is like within the two or three second range of hearing the the thunder. And then he goes ahead and and uh, says the bracha. If, let's say the guy's sitting in the bathroom. So then again, it, it's only if he can leave the bathroom and say the bracha that fast, only that way would he be able to do it. Otherwise, there's really nothing much that he could that he could do. Okay, guys, uh, we're gonna stop over here tonight. Thank you for joining me. Zashem will continue. Lina there next week.